Well, let me say good evening to uh, everybody. First of all, welcome our our guests who are here with us this evening, and surely all of you uh, who are members of this class pay uh, big bucks to be here. Glad to have all of you here this evening. And we are uh, honored to have with us this evening before we actually start our class. Um, one of uh, our own, and that is uh, Ajane Willis. Ajane, uh, of course, is, uh, is a product of North Carolina Central University. Uh, before North Carolina Central University, Elizabeth City State University, where she was actually Student Government Association president. Uh, she came to North Carolina Central University to the graduate program and uh, made uh, uh, and, and took her game to another level. And uh, she is now a PhD student at uh, the University of Houston. Uh, she should be finishing her dissertation sometime within the next few months. I'm so she'll talk about that. But we're so glad to have her with us this evening uh, to be a part of our class and also what uh, we call information plus hour. We're actually combining the class and information plus. So thank you all for being here to be a part of this. Uh, Ajane is going to talk to us this evening about uh, the impact, the influence of alcohol in the black community, I guess from slavery times down to the present. And so Ajane, it is your floor. And I'm sure that you will entertain any questions that uh, we may have uh, during and after our presentation. Ajane. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I will say that I'm so happy and excited to just be back in a class with Dr. Parker. Um, so thank you, Doc, for having me. You know how much we desperately miss being in your classes. You all enjoy him while you have him in class. He might talk <laughs> a little trash, but I promise it is, it's all good stuff. And you'll find out that it's all necessary. Um, so I am Ajane T. Willis. Um, Dr. Parker pretty much gave the gist of uh, me coming to North Carolina Central, et cetera. So I'll just jump into uh, where I am in the doctorate. And then from there, we'll move uh, into the conversation. And Dr. Parker, if you feel that I'm missing anything, just stop me and I'll, I'll go back. Um, also, all I do, I do have uh, built-in periods of reflection inside of my talk. So um, I will ask that you, you know, however you reflect best, you don't have to write things down or anything like that. But um, tonight I have designed the conversation to push the envelope on where the research on alcohol in the black body needs to go. And so I'm kind of balancing, uh, giving you all some academic contextual information with opening the door for conversations that are being had, but uh, not by people who understand uh, how history can be used to solve those issues. And that's no shade to them or anything. Um, so uh, I'll start a little, a little bit about what I'm working on in the doctorate. Um, I'm under the tutelage of Dr. Richard M. Mizell Jr., uh, who began his career as an environmental historian, and he has since transitioned to both environmental and medical history. He's currently working on um, a book on uh, race and diabetes in the 20th century is going to be really powerful. Um, so shout out to Doc. Have to give him his flowers. Um, oh, he's an eagle too, I should say. Right. He's an eagle too, yes. Nice. He, Dr. Parker, you taught him. That's um, right. Yes, you did. So there's a long intellectual genealogy that you all are fitting into that's going to be beautiful. So I'm thankful that y'all get to experience that. But um, my research is environmental and medical. I focus on the 19th and the 20th centuries. Um, I do think that problems of the 20th century have the seedlings in colonial America and in early US history. And so I do my best to try not to lose that. Um, and also, um, I, I, I will insert a footnote that I think that's important because 
um, resistance in the 20th century doesn't just start then, right? Like it's a long, long, long black freedom struggle. So I try to push and capture that. Uh, on the environmental history side, I focus on capturing history of what I call black geographies, um, geographical spaces that black people have captured to build space, place, home, um, to protest their freedom within their own communities um, by building communities where they are safer, um, where they can control more aspects of their daily lives uh, outside of those communities. And I also um, do a lot of work on housing, gentrification. Um, I've done consulting on that. Um, toxic air, water, pollution, uh, and pollution history in um, in totality is really a passion of mine. And then on the medical side, um, I focus a lot on uh, the pseudoscientific theories of race. Um, these fake, these, these inherently fake ideas that have transferred and planted themselves in science as fact and the way that that motivates um, the way that people and systems digest racism. And I also do um, the history of epidemiology, et cetera, all those things. Um, Doc, did I miss anything? I think I... No, grabbing the okay. waterfront, sounds like. Okay, are there any questions thus far? No? Okay, all right, so um, we will go ahead and get into um, tonight's conversation. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted us to do, uh, Doc, I have a couple of things jotted down on a presentation, is that fine? Yes, you, you want, want that? Let me to share, let me share your screen? Uh, yeah, do you all want that though? Like put a thumbs up if y'all want that. If, if that's not really y'all bag, then we can do without. Okay, so y'all are with, okay, y'all are with the presentation. All right, we'll do that. Okay, Doc, I guess we can share. I'll go ahead. Okay. All right, I think I... Okay. All right, so I will, I will start by saying, um, are y'all good? We can see? Hold yes, on. good to go. Okay. Good, good. All right, so um, I will start by saying that uh, the ailment of colonization is a theory that I wrote for, um, for the Drugs and Empire Conference in Shanghai, China. Um, I was very blessed to be invited to that in December. A um, bunch of scholars, crazy ones, uh, should I mention, came together to talk about the history of drugs and uh, racism behind that and uh, the way that drug usage and drug distribution has been uh, racialized via like colonial colonization and empire building. Um, so tonight, I have a couple of things that I'm going to use this theory to kind of talk to you all about. And so the first one is just the state of, of the Black body as an apparatus. And the second is the way that alcohol was utilized as oh. a weapon. Um, and I'll get into some terminologies that I use in a, uh, in a moment. And then third, just talking about um, how a, a, what I call a sort of market of oppression um, is sort of a play, it's a theoretical play on, on the Black market, right? Like, um, this market that exists outside of traditional economic markets. Um, but I call it the black market because uh, it, it emerges as more of a market of oppression. So, hold on, how do I move this? Okay, a couple of terminologies that I'm using inside of this presentation. And one thing y'all will know about me, um, and I hope is to nobody's dismay, uh, I am a theorist. I love the theory behind the way people explain things and put things together. Um, and so I decided to include this for you all because I'm quite sure that you all are being challenged to prep for your historiographies, right? Some of y'all looking like, please don't bring it up, but okay. So um, the first thing that I do in this, that I'm going to use in this talk is the word Black versus African American in terms of the colonial period. I um, am a scholar that 
tries to include the black citizenship question in everything. Um, and so I push against a lot of scholars that utilize the term African Americans for black slaves because it inherently, um, it gives the idea that that black people had citizenship at a time where mm -hmm. they weren't even considered a human being. And I wanna keep the record intact. Um, the second thing is that I do use the term slave. I do not use the term enslaved as much. And it's because I want to highlight the record of the environmental and medical conditions. Um, I believe that there is a strong push to eradicate that record and um, and and I'll add that I think that the push is coming from outside of our community and we've internalized it in black intellectual spaces, but uh, there's a push in the academy to sanitize the conditions. Um, and I know that uh, that is a piece of Dr. Parker that I have kept with me. Um, so thank you, Doug. I have mentioned that in a room, by the way, and they're like, uh, were you taught by Freddie L. Parker? And I'm like, yeah. So Doug, I don't know who you've made upset with. <laughs> It's been some folks. Um, the third terminology that I utilize in the construction of this theory and in the uh, explanation that I'll use tonight is the black body. But understand, when I say the black body, I mean two things. First, I mean individual, actual black bodies. And then the second thing that I mean is the black body in terms of a small community or a large community as an entire apparatus. And I call it a body so that we can gauge how healthy and how safe we all are as a collective, as a community. Um, the fourth thing that I'm standing so firm on in this, uh, in this presentation is that America and the United States, I do not use interchangeably. Um, there are times where I refer to America after the construction of the United States because I'm referring to a stream of ideas. Um, as an environmental historian, I will push the next generations of uh, environmental historians to answer the question about whether or not America is a geography or if it is an ideological geography, what kind of place is that term in theory and in actuality. Um, and the fifth terminology that I use that is truly a root of this entire conversation is the term weaponization. And as an environmental and medicalist, I use weaponization for one key fact, because weaponization in my work captures the process, and it's a wicked and an evil one. It captures the process of taking something that is naturally occurring, that is damaging or not as damaging, and fashioning it to use it in an unnatural purpose, okay? And so weaponization can really, um, it, it emerges in a lot of different ways. And I hope that there are some scholars on here that will bring that up later on. Um, Felton, I'm, I'm thinking about you. Uh, are there any questions thus far about any of the terminology, theory, et cetera, before we get into it? Any comments? I have a question. Sure. Um, Kayla? Is that yes. you? Okay, all right, I'm with it, Kayla. Okay, so I know that you were talking about, I like the the black body as it references one person or it could also reference a mass of black people. But I had a question about the America versus the United States and it not being interchangeable. Sure. Why, Um, how do I wanna phrase this question? Why did you decide to do that? I, so, I just wanted more context. I appreciate that, Kayla. And if you want more context throughout the rest of this, please do chime in and let me know. Um, so for this specific conversation, the reason why I use America and the United States in ways that are not interchangeable, because there are times where when I use the United States, I want to capture uh, physical laws, physical movements, physical um, interactions that are happening. And then I use America to capture the ideological history because what you all are going to find out is that there are two streams of things going on. Alcohol, there are ideologies, racialized ideologies around alcohol. So I use the term America to capture that. 
right? Um, and then when I talk about the United States, I'm talking about state-sanctioned political and legal power that then results in physical interactions and exchanges between people. Does that make sense, Kayla? It does. Okay, any further questions? No? Okay, all right, we're ready. So y'all know that I love reflection. I kind of gave y'all that disclaimer. So the first thing I want y'all to do before we really get into this is just take a moment to really consider um, any of your immediate positive or negative memories that come to mind regarding alcohol. And then the second, and you can choose one, uh, you can choose one of these or you can do all three, whatever. Um, and then the second is how would you describe your relationship to alcohol and what factors influence that relationship? And third, what would you say alcohol is utilized for? I'm gonna give y'all like, like 30 seconds. And I need to do mine too, so. Um. Dr. Parker, don't make them turn this in. I wasn't trying to give them uh, an assignment because I know how you are seen. <laughs> Do not make them turn this in, please. Can't talk about it. We can write about it. We have an exam, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Doc, that wasn't that wasn't a yes or a no. Okay. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm gonna give like 10 more seconds. Ronika says she about to be fully transparent. I enjoy that. I welcome that. Bibi says, are we putting our answers in here? Sure. I would love for you all to put your answers in the chat. If you feel comfortable enough to put your answers in the chat, do it. And do not feel like you have to um, mitigate or eliminate any real truths. That's what we're here to talk about. So I, I guess I'll give a couple more seconds for people to put uh, these things in the chat then. I should put mine in the uh, chat. No, I just changed the slide. I'm so sorry, y'all, hold on. Okay, where are we at? Right here. Okay. Mm. Okay, Ronika is going on. Okay, Ronika. I appreciate that. Dr. Parker, you are not safe from the assignment. I hope you're writing things down. I'm enjoying giving you an assignment, by the way. <laughs> I really am. Just thinking. Okay, so while we do this, I'll go ahead and just kind of talk through mine. Um for me, for the third one, the third one really hits home and um, you all continue to put your answers in. The third one for me, I have been socialized, family, friends, et cetera, to associate alcohol with leisure and relaxation. And that's to somebody's detriment. And that is also to somebody's like uh, celebratory whatever. Um, but for me, and I, I will give y'all a full disclaimer, I do not drink. Um, I didn't start drinking and then stop or anything like that. I do not drink as a form of spiritual resistance and spiritual protection. And we'll get into that when we talk about resistance. Okay, some folks are saying neutral. Some people are pointing out that alcoholism runs in their family. Alcoholism runs in my family as well. Um, someone says they don't drink very often because of family history. They don't like the taste of alcohol. Ever since Asala, ooh, call it out. I was, <laughs> <laughs> call it out. Asala is really crazy. <laughs> yeah, Asala has done some stuff too. So. Ooh, Asala <laughs> is 
praise. I have my own story about Asala, but I promise y'all, y'all will not get that story because I will have to call out, um, I'll have to call names and I just can't do that. Not before I go on a job market. I need to get a job. <laughs> okay, so we're ready to move on. Keep in mind, um, I want you all to, so what I'm doing is I'm building layers of your reflection. And then at the end, I want you all to share some of these layers. Um, so you all can keep posting about this in the chat as we move forward. Um, and at the end, I want y'all to really focus on combining all of these so that you can come to a conclusion, whether that be historical, spiritual, or whatever. But I want you all to come to a conclusion at the end. Oh, y'all. Okay, my thing is, tr like, I think it's my mouse. I'm sorry. Y'all, please be patient with me. Um, okay, so... Let's get into some of the uh, some of the complexities of alcohol culture in the colonies. There are two streams of things happening at the same time. So, first of all, pre-revolutionary ideas regarding uh, Englishmen. Um, one of the basis of that ideological history is that these folks imported myths regarding water, alcohol, and health, and many of them are steeped in. Um, matters that come out of the church movement and and the other part is science that uh, they imported a lack of knowledge regarding microbiology epidemiology the environment um and and the way that diseases spread etc so alcohol was linked to health in a very unique way and it was consumed in the place of water and there are two main, y'all know I'm a medical historian, so let me get in my disease bag for a second, because these are really two um, unique diseases that some people believe are eradicated, but are really starting to resurface in certain parts of the world. So I wanted to drop some information about that. The first uh, major disease that Englishmen were getting was dysentery. It's also known as the bloody flux, right? So on some colonial records, you'll see it as the bloody flux come up, but they're referring to dysentery. So what that is, is it is a violent gastrointestinal infection. And you get that by consuming water that um, has been contaminated with human waste. Um, in, if you drink stagnant water, some of that bacteria is present, like water from swamps or something like that. Um, and there's no cure for that. And so being that there was no cure for that, one of the strange bit of ideological connections that Englishmen made was this idea that if you drink alcohol and avoid getting dysent uh, dysentery, um, that you have... Um, you have uh, conserved your physical strength, right? Um, what would happen to the body when they got this, this infection was that you would literally see people get weaker and weaker every single day. And this is a bacteria that um, would be in your body for about a four week period. So keep that in mind, the association they're making because of that disease. Second um, is typhoid fever. You'll see this on the colonial record as slow fever, burning fever. There are quite a lot of, uh, some, some people will say, especially in the colony of Virginia, the fever. Typhoid fever is responsible for destroying um, around like 80% of the first people that came into Jamestown. They were drink along the James River, they settled on a part of it that was extremely, um, it was stagnant. Um, and so that in combination with uh, their nasty hygiene habits. They were dumping human waste in the water, et cetera. Y'all, typhoid fever is nasty. What it is, is it's a bacteria that gets into your body. Um, and some, some epidemiologists and microbiologists are arguing that this is sort of a, um, a bacteria that causes a toxin to be released. There's some conversation around that. But what the toxin does uh, with typhoid fever is it infects the nervous system. And what it causes you to do is to have these sort of um, these sort of periods where you're just kind of like in another world. And so when you hear colonists and when you see the record talk about the fever, right, or like a feverish 
dream state or whatever, typhoid fever is what they're referring to. But what this, what this disease caused colonists to do was to drink and began to associate choosing alcohol over water with the clarity of mind, um, that you can see things for what it is, and um, that you have this sort of youth, this sort of vitality, and this overall health. And so uh, those are a couple of the, uh, some of the biological reasons why alcohol uh, swept the colonies and was wildly consumed. So from there, I make that point to drive home that alcohol is a power that upholds the myth of white supremacy. Um, it emerges as a currency and it emerges as a leisure. And so by 1770, we have uh, these sort of things popping up on the colonial record um, saying that you woke up this morning and you had an eye opener, right? Or before you went to bed, you all had a nightcap. These are terms rooted in colonial alcohol culture. An eye opener is basically like a strong shot. Um, and of course, we all know what a nightcap was. But by this same year, uh, average, average Englishmen uh, over the age of 15 were consuming around three and a half gallons of alcohol, mostly rum. Um, and so some of the cultural practices that surround that in the colony of Virginia, they encouraged, they encouraged drinking. Um, they drank at all of these barbecues. Um, and there's a strange sort of connection between alcohol and elections. Um, and I think that we can still kind of see some of that. But this is how steeped it was. New England was not safe, even with all of their Puritanism. Um, the New England folks referred to it as, uh, as the good creature of, of, of God. Um, and the difference between the New England attitude towards alcohol is that they, you can see them sort of have conversation in their records about approaching it with some, um, with some, with some pause to, to recognize and respect that it is a strong drink, uh, but they still use it as widely. In fact, um, by the next decade, by the 1880s, we see laws go on the books in New Hampshire, uh, Rhode Island, et cetera, those spaces um, that, that are asking and requiring ministers to stop being drunk in the pulpit on Sunday. So, um, I did all of this because I want you all to see that alcohol is pervasive and alcohol consumption is pervasive, which is going to start to explain why they began to use it as a weapon. Um, children as well. Children, the, the syrupy liquor at the bottom of rum jars were saved for children because they would take it as like, as, as like the nightcap or um, something like that. There are even some records that indicate children would bring that syrup um, to, to have lunch uh, out in public spaces as well. So um, alcohol becomes weaponized in this space in, in an immediate way. Before we even introduce conversation about the black body, these ideas about why alcohol is important are going to sustain white supremacy in a unique way because remember, they also import the ideas that European society, particularly English society, are that their ideas and their practices are driving civilization, right? And therefore, human behavior and alcohol becomes a really important concept. So um, one of the first things, is this, y'all, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to keep doing this to make sure we good. Okay. So real quick, I just want to insert that one of the first ways when we introduce the Black body into this sort of culture, right? Because Black bodies come with their own alcoholic culture. But the difference is, is that alcohol in West African societies, there are even um, some records that indicate that Haitians, they may use alcohol, they use it as a leisure. But the number one reason for using alcohol was medicine, medicinal which is a whole different thing. Um, and that, that's a whole nother book right there. So there's that. But by 1764, the colony of Rhode Island, and I'm jumping back and forth between New England and the South, because of course, y'all know we are up against the myth that only the Southerners did X, Y, and Z, and that it wasn't widespread. But by 1764, the colony of Rhode Island 
um, is a unique place. They do not have extremely widespread plantations, but they are emerging very quickly as the steers of the transatlantic slave trade. They are the ship captains, they are the builders, they are the people who are um, developing a culture of dis distillation of rum so that way they can trade that rum on the west coast of Africa down in the islands for in exchange for the black body. And um, I will also mention that the profits from um, the profits from these uh, these distilleries and, and places like Newport go on to build um, some of some of the nation's greatest institutions, right? That the black body is then barred from. So one of the first ways that alcohol is weaponized in a colonial space is that it is something naturally occurring, right? The fermentation process is a natural thing that occurs, but it becomes weaponized because you take a naturally occurring process and you fortify it, and then you distribute it to then um, exchange for a human body. And then you bring those human bodies because you bring those human bodies for the sole purpose of supplying the raw materials where around 30% of them before 1800 are going to these distilleries. And so, we see very early, before we even get tippling laws on the books, that this is a process in which the Black body is enslaved several times over. Because what you then do with the goods from that raw material that they've been enslaved to produce is that you use the funds from that to not only consume alcohol and enact violence on them, but you use those funds to begin to build state sanctioned power that continue to stack the books with laws that keep them enslaved. So moving forward, I just want to take a bit of time to just talk about some of the laws around this, um, because a couple of places emerge as a few case studies that need a lot more research on. So by 1609 in Jamestown, we see sort of a catalyst thing happen. Newspapers in London are running ads for uh, folks in Jamestown saying, giving, giving direct calls for more brewers to come across the water. And they're being very open and very honest about what this alcohol is being used for. They're saying things like, they are not as many colonial taxes, et cetera, right? They're having this conversation about how you can come and you can use alcohol not just to make money, but to use it as a form of socio-political currency. So 1657, we see the colony of Massachusetts pass one of its first laws banning the sale of alcohol to indigenous people, which is a strange, which is a strange phenomenon because um, I'll get into that later. That's gonna take me on the whole thing. So uh, by 1698, we see Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Virginia, and South Carolina introduced something on the books called a tippling law. Now, tippling laws are really pervasive, and they, um, when they come out on all of these books, I should have put like a couple of photos of them, but when they come out on all of these law books, um, they come out with a lot of the same terminology, which means that conversation has been had in all of these different spaces. And remember, Kentucky was connected to several other geographical spaces. Uh, but what a, tippling law, what a tippling law is, and I just want to make mention that on the colonial record, you'll see it with one P or two P's. Um, it's interchangeable. But what a tippling law is, is a law specifically designed for Black people to bar them from drinking, producing, and distributing alcohol. And so I want to take a pause here because we're going to get into how this gets a bit worse. But what this law does is it opens up the pathway for white people to begin surveilling Black people and some of their movements 
um, in, a, in a really interesting way that paves the way for a lot of problems that we have. So post-revolution is where we see more tippling laws go on the books. And just a bit of environmental history, the Revolutionary War causes um, what has become the United States to transition from rum to whiskey because of the barred access to um, molasses and uh, a couple of other raw materials. But what it causes them to do is since, since rum becomes so expensive, people in the US, Americans began to look for cheaper ways to distill alcohol. And of course, we know that immigration from other parts of Europe is happening at the same time. And so they arrive at whiskey as this really cheap form of alcohol, right? That's what happens in the mechanics of it. But on the ideological side, it causes people to associate alcohol to wealth building for the elites. And for poorer whites, it causes them to be um, more economically conscious about pricing of alcohol, about the geography of where alcohol is being produced, and about how they can then begin to use alcohol um, to, to one, have their drinks more cheaply, and two, to make some money themselves. And another thing is happening at the same time, people that are moving out further, um, so-called West, right, that are pushing out West just a, a little bit more, they are realizing that the corn that they're producing is not going, is not going to be as feasible because they're not going to turn the profit. Um, from shipping the corn across um, such a larger geography. So what they do with that, on the record, they turn it into liquid assets, which are which is uh, whiskey distillation. So by this point, we got a couple of things that are beginning to take place that's about to push white Americans to really begin to turn up the violence um, against the black body using alcohol. Whiskey is uh, between post-revolution in 1830, whiskey is going for 25 cents a gallon. That means whiskey is cheaper than coffee, tea, beer, wine, etc. So that means that whiskey has become a really hot commodity for amongst white Americans, lays the seeds for it being racialized. And so by 1830, whiskey consumption amongst white colonists, um, and this data is taken mostly from men, I must um, put that on the record. But for white colonists over the age of 15, it has increased substantially, right? Before this, it was three and a half gallons. Now it's around seven. So that means that alcohol has become even more of an ingrained way of life. It's become economic, it's become political, and it's become social. So between the periods of 1830 and 1850, we start to see white women have their temperance movements. And I'll get into some early black temperance movements in a couple of slides. But as white women and, uh, and, and other religious movements like the Great Awakenings, et cetera, as these things sweep the nation, it begins to do something strange. Amongst white Americans, it is causing them to over police the consumption that they're having of alcohol. Uh, because what they're doing, and something strange that needs a bit more uh, conversation in the research record and the historiography, is some of the ideologies behind the temperance movement. Um, white women are using this as a way to not only gain political power, but to, to have conversations about the health, right? White health, and, and to preserve uh, the white body in a way that's going to directly conflict with the black body because the black body is going to be used as a, uh, as a, how can I say it? As a, mm, as a mechanism to uh, do the work, to, to take some of the medical experiments, et cetera, that white bodies now want to preserve. So um, let's put a pin in that and let's talk about Kentucky for a second. Um, by 1817, between 1817 and 1823, 
a couple of things happen. Um, as alcohol consumption becomes increasingly more popular around white Americans, we see tippling laws start to do something funny. Not only do tippling laws, uh, initially tippling laws barred black people from drinking alcohol, from distributing alcohol and producing alcohol, but it's now going on the books that you cannot be present at a physical location at a public accommodation where alcohol is present. You cannot be on the premises at all, which is a substantial um, way that the law is becoming more extreme. Black people are now having even more movements controlled, right? Because one thing I argue in my work is that movement is freedom. And one thing that slavery does geographically is it boxes Black people into certain spaces and pushes them out of other places. And so as tippling laws uh, <laughs> become more and more concentrated on what they're causing Black people to not be able to do, it's literally um, dropping the seedlings for things like Jim Crow, which I'll get into, because these are some of the first laws on the books where Black people cannot be on the premises of a house, and it, it's sweeping, of a house, of, of a bar, of a saloon. If there is, uh, if, if, if a slave has been sent to, to drop something off for business, at a, at a business where uh, the, the people there, the white folks there are having alcohol with lunch, they cannot be on the premises. Okay, so we see alcohol be weaponized as a form of control. And it's, it's working to control a couple of things. First of all, it's opening the door for state-sanctioned surveillance on Black people in public spaces, which is a, a serious expansion from um, plantation laws and laws about runaways, et cetera. Now this surveillance is happening in key public spaces. Um, which is something that should be uh, expanded on. And by 1857, in the midst of all of that unrest that's happening in conversations about slave power, state-sanctioned slave power with the North versus the South, and, and this eve of civil war, we even see tightening restrictions on uh, so-called free Blacks, and I say so-called free, because we do <laughs> not have access to citizenship, et cetera. But we see them go back onto these same laws and add that whether you are free, newly free, were born free, they don't care. Nobody Black can have any type of movement near any premises where alcohol is. And this is happening for a few reasons. One, because one of the arteries from... Uh, um, American colonists utilizing alcohol as a form of currency, if that doesn't then become state sanctioned, that's then a loophole in which Black people can wiggle in and begin to make money and trade alcohol for goods. And we see these laws tightening because there is this fervor about Black resistance. There's this conversation about alcohol and blackness that's being had, that's dangerous. Um, and mainly they are associating alcohol with uh, the black ability to, first of all, relax because alcohol is this sort of, um, it's a drug that is utilized. And there are some scholars that contest whether or not alcohol is a drug, I will say that. That was a whole thing at the conference in China but there, um, being that alcohol was seen as a form of health and leisure, policing Black leisure, right? We know that uh, laws exist on the books, especially in uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, about slaves coming together uh, without white people present. So alcohol then becomes another way in which Black leisure and um, their, their free time from working, so-called free time from working, can be controlled and policed. 
And so now I want to take a minute to kind of look at, um, at resistance a little bit, because um, during the early part of the 19th century, there are some Black people that are not bound that are beginning to talk about how alcohol is being used differently against free Blacks and against Blacks that are enslaved. So, and this is opening up the pathway to, to, to the second way that, excuse me, the third way that alcohol is being weaponized. The first way is that it's being used as a currency to buy and sell Black bodies. The second way is that it is being weaponized um, to control Black movements, to open the door for state-sanctioned surveillance and for white vigilantes to surveil Black people in terms of alcohol consumption and what they're doing on, uh, in, in Black markets that, um, that are causing them to build networks amongst themselves. So one of the things that needs to be explored more deeply is we, we have quite a few works on people like William Wells Brown, Frederick Douglass, right? Martin Delaney, um, Amanda Smith. We have works on them. But not really a lot of people have talked about the speeches and the writings and the articles that they put out calling for Black people to see the way that white Americans were weaponizing alcohol against them. And um, you'll see it in things like Douglas's conversation about what does the 4th of July mean to, to Black people. So I encourage you want to go back like look at some of those speeches and find where alcohol and where health is kind of coming up um but i just want to point out a couple of things here before we move on as these black leaders are calling attention to citizenship and they're calling attention to freedom and some of them are controversial i already know um which we can get into that at the end i welcome that but one of the things that they're doing is they're saying, they're talking about the Black mind. They're talking about ideologies that Black people must hold to continue to, um, to put down slavery as a system. And one of the things that Douglas talks about openly and Smith talks about openly is the way that free Blacks are barred from alcohol um, as a currency so that way they cannot build Black wealth that way that um, state sanctioned people can come into uh, some of their black operations and search, right, for alcohol, which I'll get into because that reemerges during prohibition. So for free blacks, the, the tippling laws open the door for that kind of surveillance, for black people to gather, excuse me, for white people to gather more data on black spaces where white people are not present and to keep them away from spaces where white people are um, building power, building currency, and, and, and enjoying leisure. But the second thing that they uh, bring up, especially Douglas and Smith, they bring up the way that alcohol is then illegally granted to Black people on a plantation as well. So something strange is happening here, but it's very, very, very typical of America to be doing two things at once. So here we have a situation where Black people are barred from making money off alcohol, while at the same time, they plant white planters in the South, especially in the Carolinas, and especially in Georgia, are beginning to build a culture of seasonal alcohol consumption that um, are, uh, they're popping up on the calendar around times of holidays. So Douglas uh, talks specifically about the ways that, boom, from the transition from spring to the fall planting season, there are times where white planters would inundate their slaves with barrels and barrels and barrels of whiskey so that they can be drunk and use it as a form of control, right? That way that during this transitional period where white people are occupied with a couple of duties that are seasonal, where they can be in a mental state that is then um, 
less likely to be focused on uh, building pathways to freedom and resistance and power and more focused on leisure. So we see here that alcohol is given to Black people as a form of control to suppress the Black hope for freedom and the, the power building that's happening. And so from there, there's, there's another way that that sort of uh, becomes a derivative because there are circumstances where slaveholders will also buy and sell Black people um, and to, in order to pay them to be overseers with alcohol. Um, there are other circumstances where um, at the end of planting seasons, around Christmas, around Thanksgiving, right, where slaves would be told, if you work X amount here, we will give you X amount barrels of whiskey. So this is really pervasive. Alcohol is being weaponized on two sides. And, and what is alarming to me is the way that it is comprehensive. Um, and that should be alarming. And I hope that that encourages someone to continue that research. So in response to that, Black women, especially in Black churches, um, began to have this conversation. And we're going to move into what that looks like um, during Reconstruction, because something really important starts to happen then. But Black women, especially, began to have this conversation alongside Black men and Black men alongside Black women. Black women are doing a good bit of the organizing, but they're sharing ideas about the effects that alcohol has on Black women and Black men. That Black men have associated drinking with, um, with pain from work. And so they build, they're starting to cement these cultures of drinking at night on the plantation and for free Blacks coming home and drinking after work. And Black women are articulating these emotional pains that they're utilizing alcohol to, um, to, to kind of help that subside. And I want to stick a pin in this because as a medical historian, I have to encourage people to see, even myself to see, that a couple of streams of Black thought are being birthed and are being cemented here. Medical recognition on a deeper level, Black people start to talk about alcohol as an emotional thing because of the plight that the Black body is experiencing that they're talking about alcoholism and mental health before white women fashion that into um, what their movements are going to be during prohibition. We don't see that come back on the record in a really substantial way until the 50s and the 60s and the 70s with the rise of psychiatric wards and this conversation around mental health. But this is something that's being had in the late 19th century. And so Black people in the midst of alcohol being weaponized against them, they more than realize it. They began to understand the nuances. They began to have classes about how to get off. And this is something I'm praying somebody explores. These early gatherings about how to help your husband get off alcohol. These early gatherings that Black women have about what does the Bible say about alcohol. These conversations about what needs to happen, um, which is really beautiful, by the way, what needs to happen to heal the Black body from the constant uh, pains from working so that way people can stop drinking alcohol um, for pain. And I'll insert another footnote here. The pain that they're talking about that's going to reappear in the Black power era is the plight of arthritis on the Black body. And so I want to kind of connect these two in a really crazy way. But slave laws and tippling laws control Black freedom by controlling Black movement, right? From there, the work of slavery and the way that the environment was weaponized against them, the agriculture, the day in and day out of working in early industry, 
what that does is create chronic inflammation inside of the body that is then subsidized, put down, trying to be cured or um, alleviated by alcohol. So there are several things um, converging at this point. So I just wanted to insert a couple of notes about the artery, right? I call this an artery because it's, it's, a, it's a carryover from colonial laws into now. And I call it an artery because arteries supply, right? And the reason why I call it an artery is because as it stretches across these historical timelines, right, these chronological threads, these sociopolitical, these economic threads, even um, the threads of disease history, health history, et cetera, as it stretches across these chronological spreads, it is supplying several issues that we still have today. And we'll pause and reflect on that at the end. But I wanna talk briefly about tippling laws during the Civil War. During the Civil War, another strange phenomenon happens, particularly in the South. Southerners have come, have become more accustomed to weaponizing alcohol in those two ways, right? In northern parts and western parts, alcohol is used just to bar, but southerners develop the strategy of inundating black people with alcohol to have them um, indisposed. And so what happens building on top of that culture during the Civil War is that when many of the southern breweries get destroyed, and southerners don't have they do, but they don't. They don't necessarily have breweries that look the way that um, people in New England do. Southerners mostly have like a shot house or like a barn or something like that, but they're still brewing. But the way, when, when those get destroyed, they then began to allow slaves to help in the brewing process until about 1864-ish, when slaves have then dropped the seedlings for what Black communities are gonna do in Reconstruction, which I'll talk about soon, they dropped the seedlings of using alcohol as a means to develop their own form of currency. And the second thing that's happening is that not only is alcohol strengthening these Black social networks, right? Because they're talking to Black people from different ways, um, specifically along the Mississippi, alcohol is being moved up the Mississippi. So you got all these boys that you know alongside all these communities. But Black whiskey makers, and somebody jot this down, do the study on it. There are about four or five Black whiskey makers who are brewing elixirs that taste better than white brewers. And that becomes a problem for the South. That becomes a problem even for military strategy because what happens is that before they realize that some of these black brewers are, are brewing elixirs that are really good and they can potentially gain power from it, military strategy is even being affected because the Confederates are saying, we need to avoid this geography, that geography, why? Because people have large whiskey distilleries in woods, et cetera. And so Black brewers and slaves during the Civil War is a unique thing that needs more attention. So after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, that is the first time that we're able to start to see the way that Black people post so-called emancipation use alcohol in the midst of Black codes. First of all, I want to insert that the basis of Jim Crow is barring access from public accommodation. And I want to stress that tippling laws need to be explored as a foundation for Jim Crow Black codes. Because the reason why we cannot explain as historians how immediately after the Civil War, Black codes arise in both social practices 
and political practices is because we've overlooked the legacy of tippling laws. These are laws that were on the books that openly not only barred Black people from being on premises, public premises, but it also initiated white vigilanteism. White people need to be looking for Black people to be barred from public spaces. That is a key foundation for why Black codes are able to be applied so quickly. The social and the political infrastructure is already there. And so the culture of alcohol consumption becomes twofold. Alcohol is weaponized against Black bodies and reconstruction during Reconstruction in two key ways. First of all, the tippling laws become the Black, uh, excuse me, they become the foundation for Jim Crow. And I also want to insert a footnote there. There are several records that indicate that most white polling workers that surveil and bar Black people in spaces like, um, like Mississippi, like Biloxi especially, many of them were under the influence of alcohol. So there's another way that alcohol becomes weaponized. There are a couple of records that I've seen and I'm like, wow. You are at the polling place drunk, whatever. So there's that. But the second way that alcohol becomes weaponized is that Black people have a part. Notice I am stressing a part because we do have our own culture of alcohol consumption that stretches um time and space that we brought over from other geographies, but a piece of, of alcohol consumption, the culture of alcohol consumption amongst black communities is still in line with the ways that white planners inundated black bodies with alcohol. And so you began to see black spaces of leisure, even the ones that do not sell alcohol, around certain seasons that are still in line with the season, the work seasons where white planners would inundate black people with alcohol, around those seasons they sell alcohol. There's a piece of the culture, the medical and the environmental piece that is bleeding over. And during reconstruction, alcohol becomes a key space of leisure, right? Folks got they got music halls where they drinking, et cetera, um, as leisure. And, um, and the third way that I'll say, um, here, herein lies some of the seedlings for over-policing during prohibition because as Black towns pop up, and I'm a Black towns historian, as Black towns pop up, right, all Black spaces during Reconstruction, this happens as a movement, there are some historians that would argue against that, but I'm, I'm standing on that, y'all. <laughs> like, I'm gonna keep standing on that. Building Black towns was a movement. As these all Black spaces pop up and they are boxed and barred out from federal funds to build infrastructure, they turned to alcohol as a form of currency and began re-infusing Black communities with these networks a buying, selling, uh, distilling alcohol. One of the key places, I was in ATF files um, over the, was that the summer? No, I think that was late last semester. In ATF files at East Carolina to see what alcohol uh, distribution, et cetera, looked like for black people in the Northeast. It is very well known that in the Northeast were some of the largest distilleries from reconstruction on they many of them were hidden in the woods and it is on the record that a lot of atf agents by um by the 50s are aware of this and they're mentioning that oh these black people here have a long line of hiding large lucrative distilleries in woods in swamps and using that currency to, to build not only Black social networks, but to get money on the Black market to build infrastructure. In my dissertation, I'm getting into that. 
Um, and I'll circle back to that. So I want to recap some of the longer legacies of tippling laws. The first artery and the first way that we can see the weaponization of alcohol come to fruition is Jim Crow and the policing of public spaces starting in a post-emancipation era that does not pop up, that is on the books. The second way is during prohibition. So at the start of prohibition and on into the Cold War era, first of all, let me take it back. What prohibition does is when it prohibits alcohol, consumption, uh, et cetera, the law is not applied evenly. White spaces are not policed the same way black spaces are. So prohibition is a key time period because during prohibition, those tippling laws that had state sanctioned power saying black folk can't be over here and white people need to look out for it and report it become federal laws. And federal dollars, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> federal dollars become um, conduits that trickle down into federal agencies that are now over police in black spaces and social entities that are over police in black spaces. We start to see state sanction and federal sanction police power being built around policing alcohol. And they're using alcohol <laughs> because it is a substance associated with leisure first. And second, because you need to access a public space and come inside where you can gather intel and see if alcohol is on the premises. And so herein is the rise of over-policing of the Black body via the weaponization of alcohol. So, so developing that into the Cold War era period, during the Cold War, Black radicalism looks more like human rights than civil rights, right? They're talking about an overall a full access to Black citizenship. But what the Cold War era does and the rise of anti-communism does is it builds on top of the legacy and the foundation laid by prohibition for police to over-police Black communities. Not only do we have alcohol in play, but during the Cold War era, Black resistance becomes associated um, pseudo-scientifically and pseudo-ideologically with communism, which then opens the door for another place in space. And, and I'll put a pin in this because one of the things that several Black food historians have talked about is the places and spaces of leisure, right? Food, music, et cetera, where Black people come together to build these resistance movements. Alcohol is still in the picture. When the Cold War era begins to associate Black radicalism with uh, communism, that expands the things that the federal government, the state government, white vigilanteism, and police can utilize to over surveil and over police Black spaces. And so from there, the third artery, I would say, is the way that alcohol and the control of Black leisure and the, mani oh wait, I'm sorry, let me go back, y'all, let me go back. One thing I need to include during the Cold War, um, and this is a point of passion, so y'all just let me live for a second. One thing I need to include during the Cold War is a key um, infrastructural piece. Around 1935, when the federal government issues laws helping push federal dollars into rural spaces to help them get electricity, running water, et cetera, Black towns are boxed out of that. And the tax dollars are utilized by local white towns. And so what happens um, during the Cold War is that, just like during Reconstruction, 
those old social networks of bootlegging during uh, Reconstruction and Prohibition become reinstated as a means to um, as a means to bring uncontrolled dollars into black communities. The black town that I'm doing a study on, Princeville, North Carolina, the reason why they got street lights was because of bootlegging. So I just wanted to insert that. But finally, I wanted to talk about police brutality and its current state. It is not a coincidence, first of all, that Majority of the times, Black leisure is what's being had when Black bodies are over-policed. It's also not a coincidence that um, there is a strange geographical proximity to spaces of Black leisure um, or even spaces where alcohol is sold, like gas stations, etc., where police brutality is taking place. And finally, I will add that one of the key ways that police are taught to gain access to a space is by gaining, using perception, right? Not even a systematic scientific uh, process, but to gauge drunkenness, to gauge intoxication, which there's too much room for, um, for human error and for human bias to seep into that. And so, Finally, um, wait, no, there was one thing I wanted to add. I'm sorry, y'all. I can be a bit scatterbrained <laughs> sometimes, but I'm gonna keep it real with y'all. There's another thing I wanted to add. When we factor in all of the ways that the weaponization of alcohol comes together, we still arrive at the fact that Black freedom is being mitigated by controlling Black movement and Black health. And so what needs to be connected is this conversation about using alcohol as a weapon over time and how that then boils down to the fact that Black communities are geographies that are poisoned with an outlet of Black liquor, of liquor stores, excuse me, that are not even owned by Black people. It's a running joke that in the hood, it's nothing but liquor stores and churches. And we're not talking about chicken. We're talking about actual, you know. But how is it that we haven't connected the ways that alcohol has been weaponized against us to the fact that our communities are now communities with the most liquor stores. And finally, um, one of my last thoughts is what role does, um, what role does vulturous marketing practices of alcohol companies, right? Because all of these alcohol, so some of the major U.S. alcohol producing companies uh, emerge between 1830 and 1850. So these are people that are coming into business at the height of tippling laws being concentrated and expanded. And so that needs to be connected to the power that those corporations still have to weaponize, oversell, overmarket, um, poisonous elixirs. And the last thing I'll say before we do a final reflection is that I am very well aware that this is one side of Black alcohol history, right? There's a whole other celebratory Black alcohol history that also needs to be written about. Black, black brewers, um, like, um, companies like, um, oh no, don't let it escape me, God. Companies like Brown Baby Beverages in, um, in Birmingham, Alabama, got their start making 
and distilling alcohol. So there, there is a whole other side to this where alcohol and resistance to alcohol and resistance using alcohol in more positive ways, right? Like black nurses during the civil war, black nurses during other wars and, and during the middle part of the 20th century, there's a whole history for how black people refashion alcohol um, into, into more positive things. And so for your final reflection, I want to know, and, and what I'm asking y'all to do is when you chime in, I want you to try to see how this connects to whatever your field is, whatever your concentration is, but how, how do you see you being able to observe these things with, with alcohol or with other drugs, et cetera? We can have a really expansive conversation, but even conversations around black addiction, even conversations around um, policing and prisons, et cetera, because Michelle Alexander doesn't really get into that in a new Jim Crow, the way that substances really drive home mass incarceration. Um, but there's that, but you can answer one of these questions, all of them. The first one I'm asking is which weaponizations do you think have caused the most damage? I put on, it should be to the black body today. And consider your personal experiences and your own individual fields if you're a historian, your concentration, like how have you seen alcohol or any other things that have been weaponized against us utilized? And then what does that then mean about what we should be focused on as scholars and also just as, as people living this experience, whether you live in a Black experience or not, or whether you pretend in that community, because there's some of us out <laughs> there pretending that we are not. But um anyone. And finally, um, I'm asking you these things as sort of a compilation of, of all of your reflections from tonight. So I will um, open up the floor for other folks. And you can give reactions or whatever as well, like whatever you feel so moved to say. Anybody? I'll share. Um, so to answer the first question, it says, which weaponizations do you think have caused or caused the most damage to the Black body today? I think everything should be used in moderation. I think the excessive nature of anything is um, harmful. Um, so even when it comes to alcohol, alcohol is not inherently bad, but when you have like access to it, like at a rate that a common person wouldn't, then you have issues. So I don't think anything is necessarily like bad. I mean, of course, like I, I don't view alcohol as a drug personally. Um, so like I could say drugs are bad, but I don't think alcohol is bad. It just kind of depends on how you use it. It says consider your personal experiences and your own work in your fields. How have you seen alcohol being utilized? A lot of my research has been on hoodoo and voodoo and like spirits and things of that nature. And so like the usage of alcohol is prominent. Um However, it's like I said, it's all about how you use it, what you're using it for. Are you using it to create something good or are you using it to create something bad? What are your intentions? What do you set your intentions to be before you like drink the spirit that you drink? It's just, it's, it's a lot <laughs> to it. Um, and then it says, what should our next focus um, focuses and solutions be. I don't feel like um, alcohol should be so easily accessible. Like I have, I teach high school and I have high school students who will come to like football games drunk and they're not even supposed to drink. So I feel like 
But I also work at a high school that's predominantly African American and Hispanic students, which bothers me because obviously it's very, very accessible to them, which is why they do it. So um maybe trying to like create um better solutions and also like talking about it and addressing the issue. Like my family comes from a long line of alcoholism and I was sheltered from it all my life. And then when I got to college, I was turning up. Like <laughs> turning up to the point where it was like, okay, maybe we need to like take a step back or, you know, we see how this has impacted some of my family members before. So like, is this the path or the road that we want to go down and having those very real conversations with teenagers before they go to college? Because I feel like a lot of a lot of this starts in high school and then leads into college or your adult life or things of that nature. It's even worse when you grow up in a household that like parents are also alcoholics. So it's like you see it every day. I have, I had an uncle and he was very abusive. And I think he's in nature a very sweet, wonderful person every other day. But like when a person actually starts drinking a lot you don't know who you're going to get it's like Jekyll and Hyde so um having those very real conversations with students and children and things like that might actually allow people to like consider how bad it could be if you don't use it in moderation or if you start drinking before you're supposed to actually start drinking Kayla, I thought I, you mentioned quite a few things. First of all, I taught high school and did a master's full time. So I'm out here for you. If you need me, call me. Um, I'm here for you. It is rough, but I'm grateful for, for the hell that you are fighting to, to do both. I respect that. Um, also, you, you touched on some key debates around is alcohol a drug? I I told y'all, y'all, when I was in China, Dr. Jim Mills, who's on faculty at University of Strathclyde at Glasgow in Scotland, asked the question and the room erupted. And folks was pointing fingers like, okay, so this is a real serious debate, right? And I think that all of, I think both sides should be explored. Also, call me about your research. There are some serious inroads um, that can be made um, in terms of like how those things are combined with other substances to form methods of resistance and spiritual awakening, et cetera. Um, so just, is there anyone else? Oh, I know what I wanted to mention, love. I see you put the clap emoji and I'm grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful, that was humbling. Thank you for that. Um, there was some other thing, there was a question that I seen, how did consumption habits vary by class and gender? That's an excellent question. Um, is there anyone else that wants to speak before I get into like some of the questions that you all have for me? Any other reactions, anything? I have a reaction to, uh, the questions, uh, those reflections, um, Ajane. Uh, in my opinion, and I, I, I guess I will be, you know, taken to the carpet with this, um, and I have been, and I've had huge arguments with people over the years, but uh, over the past 150 years, I really can't think of anything else in the Black community that has destroyed the Black community more than alcohol and drugs. Uh, when I look at the deaths, when I look at the diseases that the body actually uh, will take on because of the excessive alcohol use, uh, when I look at the fact that thousands of people have been killed uh, on the highways, thousands and thousands of people have been shot by people who were drunk because they got in fights, when you look at the destruction of families, uh, leading to divorce, leading to all kinds of dysfunction, uh, when you look at the loss of jobs, 
by black folks and people in general. I, I really can't think of anything that has destroyed black folks more than the overconsumption of alcohol and in the last 50 to 60 years, the use of, of drugs. Uh, you know, in, in, in my case, I, I can just go back and look at the number of people in my family who have died as a result of, of alcohol and drugs. I mean, I buried a son uh, two years ago uh, who uh, died as a result of, of fentanyl. Uh, so I, I see it. I had a, a brother who was killed uh, 30 years ago. And when I went to identify the body, the smell of alcohol, I could, say it was, I could smell it actually five feet away. Uh, shot in the heart because he got into a fight. He had not been, been drunk. It, the likelihood is he would not have gotten into the fight. So I, I think that when you add up and somebody will say, well, you know, I think racism is, is the thing that has been most destructive. Well, give me, I, I think that, that, that racism is the hub around which all of this revolves. You know, intentional use, uh, uses of, uh, of putting drugs in the black community by the powers to be over the last 50 to 60 years. Placing, uh, you know, these uh, uh, institutions that sell alcohol, ABC stores, putting them so close to the black community. You know, all of that is a part of a racist regime that has been in place for, for 400 years. So it's all inextricably tied together. So, you know, I, I will go to my grave saying that nothing has been more destructive to the black community mm. to be destructive than, than alcohol and, and drugs. I wanna, uh, Horace, I see your hand. I'm coming to you next. I want to- all right mentioned two personal things. First of all, I mentioned earlier that I do not drink. I do not drink. I don't touch alcohol for a few reasons. First of all, alcohol in my family and really just addiction is y'all like is so rampant and it's like to the place where even if people don't have addictions right now like you did, you know what I'm saying? And Nobody wakes up and say they want to have an addiction, but I decided I'm not going to touch any of it. That's my personal choice. I don't knock nobody that chooses to have alcohol. And um, y'all know I have been to not one, but three schools. So there's that. But um, the second thing I wanted to say was that the first time I ever experienced gun violence was one of my family members who has an alcohol addiction. It wasn't out in the street. It wasn't out... It wasn't out anywhere. It was it was my family. Um, and uh, who is that? Ronika mentioned that you can get to the liquor store faster than a grocery store. That's real. I have lived that. I have lived that. That is absolutely real. And it is worse in other geographies. And so Dr. Parker, you know, like it's, I have to admit, it's painful to you know hear the pain that you had regarding alcohol and um some of those things you know because it has it has done a number and i want to insert a footnote here and then we're going to horace y'all uh, let me throw in another layer i'm from a black military community so when you factor the weaponization of alcohol into the conversation of soldiers and then black soldiers who are dealing with a different type of stress up against social hierarchies, racialized hierarchies. I don't know, I'm sure somebody on here is from a military background. And even if you're not, there's still a whole history of black people who have returned from war using alcohol. Black people who haven't gone to war using alcohol, et cetera. So there are so many inroads. Um, but Horace, I apologize that you were waiting for such a long time. Give me. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Uh, barely. Can you guys hear me? Can now. 
Okay, um, I just wanted to uh, log on with Dr. Parker. Alcohol is it's the most dangerous substance that's legal in the world. I know when I first started going out as a young kid, when you turn 15 or 16 and your parents will let you go out, we always went to Durham when the people I was hanging out with because guess what Durham had plenty of? The liquor house. You could go get chicken or whatever you wanted to eat and party and dance, and alcohol was being sold as entertainment places for segregated neighborhoods that really didn't have clubs or legal clubs or nightclubs that we could go to. And uh, as the young lady said, in the city of New York where I work, especially in neighborhoods that house the so-called projects, there's a liquor store on every corner. So there's not a, a, a a loss of liquor. It is a dangerous drug. And I think early on, as I go back to the 60s, it was a source of income for some people to compile alcohol. They ran bootleg through North Carolina and our neighborhood where Dr. Park is. They would come down out of Danville, Virginia, swoop left to Durham on 70. So alcohol has always been in the system. And then it just got to the point where people of color who weren't educated or could get jobs started getting to sell to make money to support themselves. So I don't know the solution. Now they're talking about taking it out of liquor stores and putting it in the supermarkets. And I don't know what kind of uh, safety play mechanism they'll put in place to have children keep from buying it or stealing it. But it was a great presentation, Ms. Willis. I really appreciate that. I can't wait to get the recording because I'd like to share it with some young group of men to tell them how far this goes back. Thank I'm you. so grateful and humbled by that. Um, Mr. Horace, when you were speaking, it made me think of this fact that deserves more exploration as well. Um, <clears throat> and I'm an environmental and medical historian who is strong on like, I we need policies on some of this. Like we need policies. We need policies. We need people talking about this stuff. And there are some folks out there that are working on it. But one thing that needs a bit more exploration, first of all, it is the strangest phenomenon that American pharmacies also sell alcohol and tobacco in uncontrolled rates. Like you can buy as much as you want, whatever. At the same place you can get your medicine. But even stranger, when you look at the selection, right? And, Many of these, uh, like CVS's, Walgreens, etc., many of them are large corporations, whatever. But when you look at the way that they diversify their alcohol selection, it is what's the word I can use? It's simply insane. Some of the changes that you see that are more accessible near Black geographies. Um, so I will say that and then um, I will let, Ms. Rogers, is your name Honesty? Yes. Wow, I have, I have taught a lot of students. I have never come across someone named Honesty and I think that is really beautiful. Thank Shout you. out to the folks that name you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Wow, that, that just, I appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to speak a little bit about it because with alcohol, it's really been a conversation in the Black community for a long time. And where I'm from, it's like, it's a common thing. Because I know for me personally, when it comes down to alcohol, it started high school, like 16 years old. So, and, and it was easy to get. So like, and there was... And I say it's Black people in our own community that's hurting us because there also be Black people behind them counters, too, that's selling it. And they don't ask for no ID. You could just go in. People think you have to be 21, but you could just really just go in and they don't ask for it. So I feel like it's much deeper than that. And then it also goes back to them little sayings that we also have in our community. You give, like, you put beer in a kid's mouth or something, and it's like, and they will not want to drink later on down the line, something like that. So... I feel like it's really, I feel like that's one of the things that really have kind of set us back in a little, a little bit because alcohol is just one step to like drugs in my opinion. And 
right now it's much more deeper because it's not just regular drugs like weed or something like that. Now we got heroin, meth, and then we got perks and we got lean too. So it's like, that's not even making it much better. And that's kind of a trend now, especially with social media going on. So it's kind of glorified to do it now to drink and everything. I mean, I don't have nothing against drinking because, you know, you get, you drink every now and then for occasion. There ain't nothing wrong with that. But it can get to a point where it could really, like, really mess up your system in a way and mess you up down the line. So, yeah. You know what? You, honestly, you the real one. Like, I know that probably sounds cliche, but you, like, first of all, you bringing up the lean culture and stuff like that. Thank you for that because... I just want to insert a foot note here, excuse me, um, that how we, we have to always ask, like, where do trends start? There's a scholar on here um, who is my comrade, Felton Fouché, um, who deals sort of with media, etc. cetera. Um, also, my sister, Madison Bond, that's on here. Shout out to Madison. Y'all, that's my girl. We did two degrees together, but I had to shout my sister out. <laughs> but, uh, and Rebecca is on here. Love y'all. But um, one of the things that we frequently talk about are these trends, right? Like, we have to ask ourselves, where do these things start? Do they start with the people and then transcend into music? Or do they start in the music and then come on down to the people? That lean culture is a direct derivative of what has happened to Black music. Whether it's good or bad or this or that, like some of us on here are children of the 90s, me included. I was born in 95. I can't believe there are college students that are not 90s babies anymore. That is so strange to me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Um, I remember like some of the first times I ever heard the term lean being used like in music and I can recall in the early 2000s being a little girl like what do that mean you know what I'm so like what is that what are they talking about so the double cup culture this and that all of that needs studies because we're just now starting to see some of the effects and um, some of my sisters that I shouted out can speak because they're the social media gurus um, and I'm not. They keep me in a loop. I'm the lame one, but it's OK. Um, they keep me in a loop. But one of the things that I recall hearing is the fact that some people were saying like that they're starting to see some of the effects of like the lean culture and stuff like that on black artists like Lil Wayne and all this kind. But we're just now starting to see those effects. This stuff needs studies. And also what you said about the black people in the community that, y'all I gotta go here for the sake of the conversation and for the sake of knowledge, like that's, that's, that stays with me, like, the people perish, like, for a lack of knowledge and a lack of a vision, but a part of the way that weaponization of anything has ever worked in our community is by taking some of our community members and teaching them to become a weapon in their own community. That is really one of the only ways that we have ever been destroyed. And it's the overseer complex and it's, it's all of that. The house slave is all of that still transcending and coming up in this stuff. And um, honestly, we need studies on, well, we need historical studies. We need legal study because uh, a lot of the mental health folks are doing really good work. And I just want to make sure that I'm honoring that. Um, but a lot of them, uh, we, we need other studies on alcohol in terms of the Vietnam War vets that came back. The reason why we can't develop legislation right now to help Iraqi war veterans, et cetera, is because we still haven't seen what some of the weaponization of these substances did to us 
uh, during the 80s with the war on drugs and with our folks coming back from Vietnam and all of this stuff. Okay, Samuel, I'm going to let you talk now. Hi, Anjane. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. I just want to briefly share that uh, I started in professional gospel music in 1971. And one of the things that I saw was 90% of all the gospel quartets had ripple and all of this stuff. And when they went on stage, they were intoxicated and would not dare go on stage without having their little brew. Mm -hmm. And I remember just seeing, having a choice not to do that uh, because I saw a correlation between doing that and not having any money. So on, on the weekends that we were on the road, I just told them, I said, no, I don't want that. I'm gonna keep some money. They called me scaredy cat. It didn't matter. But I just saw how that became part of the gospel music, quartet music culture, that drink before you, that bottle before you hit the stage. And then they, that was, that was their spirit. And uh, it was just amazing. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you for enjoying it. I'm very humbled. Um, this needs even more work. Maybe this will be a book after the dissertation. But I want to say thank you for that because Honesty and I were talking about, you know, the this sort of early 2000s drinking culture and music. But you just was like, listen, it's a whole precursor. Um, and I want to acknowledge that and address that because one of the questions that I would frequently have, y'all, I'm a grandma's girl um, and my family is from the Carolinas. And so they are some really Southern people. Bless them. I love it. Um, but one thing they did was they, like many of us on here, exposed me to some of the best music from the 20th century and I was also a great granddaddy's girl like I had my great grandfather until I was 20 years old and bless him I learned so much about ragtime jazz he was born in 28 I learned about ragtime jazz he put me on so like black blue grad like put me on so much but as I got older and I began to ask what became of these people, it is not a coincidence that all of our Black entertainers, with the exception of a handful, from Reconstruction, even on the plantation, from Reconstruction to now, have been inundated with substance abuse issues. That is not by accident. That is by design. Yeah. And I, that's, that's not me saying that they chose that or anything. Those folks were trying to navigate being Black and the stresses and, and the stresses of entertainment. And so I'm not saying, I would never say somebody with an addiction or an abuse problem or anything did that to themselves. I'm a firm believer that you don't wake up and say you want to be that. So I'm very humble in approaching what I'm saying, but that is not a coincidence. Heroin took so many of them out, like alcohol took so many of them out. Like we, we have to have these conversations. We have to, because I have a little brother, so I'm 28. I have a little brother that is nine years younger than me. I just thank God to have been brought up with a strong black father that really didn't play with us. Um, my dad did not play with us, but I'm thankful for my brother because his generation is inundated with drugs and alcohol. Like, and a couple of people mentioned the easy access. And I mean, when I was in high school, um, people had easy access. I lived in a military community. I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. There was that access, but it seems to be like so widespread. And we, we have to start talking about that as scholars. Anaya, I'm going to be quiet. Um, well, one, I just wanted to start off by saying that you did a great job with your presentation. Um, I think that, ooh, okay, it, I think that um, 
you made a good point is how we joke about how much we see alcohol in the black community, how easy the access is to it, but never really having to sit a serious conversation and get into the root of the problem. Um, and what everybody else has said about this conversation, like this topic, I've noticed that you just mentioned it is so widespread. Um, there's so many nuances that we haven't gotten into. Um, I know someone mentioned earlier how um, how alcohol plays a role when it comes to abuse um, as well as, and then I'm just thinking about people who witness that abuse and it trickles down through that. Um, they pick up on fam through family and generational things, um, generational curses as I like to call them, um, but intergenerational trauma. But I did have a question specifically for you. Um, there were a lot of different um, things that you you touched on, um, but that you said that you would leave research for other people to do. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know that the tippling laws was one of those areas, but in I'm curious, in terms of your personal research, where do you see yourself expanding or moving forward with this, uh, this conversation? Thank you for that. I'm grateful and I need that um, because I am actively thinking about some of the holes and gaps in my second chapter of my dissertation. And um, that's under the, that's, that's under the impression that I have to write in a way that makes other researchers ask questions. So first of all, um, one of the reasons why I always leave it open-ended is because environmental and medical history and rural history are fields that need, they need construction. They're not actually built. You know what I'm saying? So that's why I said that. And thank you for that question because that needs to get out there. Um, the second part of your question, alcohol and the environment and the health of the black body are key themes, not alcohol, but the environment and health of the black body are key themes throughout my entire dissertation. And I do it in a lot of different ways. Like I talk about pollution, water, uh, socio-political structure, et cetera. Alcohol emerges in my second chapter where I'm talking about the way that black communities navigated um, some of the, uh, the, how they navigated the nadir of racial violence between reconstruction and 1919. Um, some of the spaces that they built for power um, and where those spaces are located, et cetera. Also the way that alcohol was used as a currency to bring in black dollars. Um, that is going in there this project, Anaya, popped up really by accident. And I'm going to tell you how. And then I'll finish answering the rest of your question. Um, I was invited to the Drugs and Empire Conference um, by a scholar in uh, the department at U of H. And I was like, I'm with it, like I'm going to Shanghai to talk about drugs and empire. And then um, my sister who's on here, I called like, sis, what am I about to present for real? Like, what am I gonna present? So I had to go back, right? Cause I was like, I'm not doing nothing new. I'm gonna pull something out of my dissertation and expand on it and start to develop a new project. And that's what I did. This project is, from this project is from the root of my conversation about black doctors and about black hospitals and black clinics etc i'm getting into the nitty gritty of that one of the reasons why black people build black clinics is to talk about things that they're using alcohol to treat which are the chronic illnesses and the other things that they use to build alcohol. The other motivating thing is what my advisor studied, which is diabetes, which we all know 
alcoholism and diabetes, type two diabetes is inextricably connected in a really crazy way. And I'm getting to domestic violence in that as well. So this project, I pulled the thread out and unraveled what I'm starting to do in my dissertation. And what I'm realizing now during this talk, because before I gave this talk, I was like, I don't know if the people going to feel this. Like, is this going to like, is this going to make sense? Y'all, I'm a bit nutty, like as an academic, like I'm scatterbrained and I love theory. And one of the things I love to do is connect long threads, super long threads, because I love to write comprehensively. But I think I'm realizing, I knew then like, okay, maybe this should be a book project. But I think I'm realizing now that maybe it must be, you know? Um, I One of the things that I'm gonna really push when I get out into the field and finish the PhD is that we have to, the next generation of historians are writing in a post-war, post-9-11, post-economic um, destruction of the housing market in 2008, economic inflation of right now. We're writing in post-war, post-economic issue, post-Bush, post-Trump, post-Obama, um, post-COVID. We got to talk about issues right now. We have to, we must, we must, we must. And so, um, I don't know, send me an email, Anaya, and tell me what you think the book should look like, and then maybe we'll write it together. <laughs> may you put your email in the chat? <laughs> I love that. Some people just would have been like, oh, and now you was like, but where the email at though? Okay, I love that. I love that. Okay, I'm putting my email in the chat and it's not going to be private because anyone that wants to send me an email, please send me an email. Um, I know there are a lot of people out there that do a lot of different jobs, etc. Students, I'm here for you. If you need um, anything from me or if you just need to cry, teachers, I'm here for you for both of those things. Um, if people are working on policy, community building, archival stuff, I'm here for all of that. However, I can be of service. That's what I'm here for. So, Anaya, there it is. And the rest of you all, there it is. Great. All right. Are there other questions or, or comments for Sister Willis? Dr. Park, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, I'm driving, uh, been on the road for the whole thing, but it was awesome, great job. Um, I just wanna highlight that one critical thing and I just know I, I'll hit that, that exploitation, but everything in, in my black American life has been about exploitation to the highest levels and exploitation of labor, exploitation of dollars. I think that's all at the core of everything we're discussing and um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Ajanae. Absolutely. Uh, Felton, uh, can you stay on for a few minutes after uh, the presentation? I am here as long as the uh, signal holds, and so far, so good. Okay. As a matter of fact, everybody, uh, Felton Fashi will be our next presenter uh, about a month from, well, maybe less than a month from here, sometime in uh, February. Okay, other questions or comments? I will make a comment. Okay. I just want to say, Dr. Parker, thank you so much for believing in my work, my crazy work. Um, and thank you for um, being a, a serious ideological influence on me. Um, the reason why I still hold fast to 19th century stuff is because of the way that, that you trained me. Um, and I see that me pulling these threads of legal history, the black citizenship question, slavery in the constitution, that is from, that's genealogy, intellectual genes that you gave to me. It 
has deepened my work in ways that are profound and it's made my work relevant and so much in the now and um, I'm grateful. Thank you for giving me this opportunity and for everything that you share with all of your students, like you are a gem, Dr. Parker. And I'm so, I know that God um, made sure that I was trained by you and I'm grateful for that. So thank you. And thanks to all of you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You, you never know what you're doing unless somebody comes along two or three, four, five, 10, 15 years later and, and uh, let you know about that. Um, but thanks so, so much. You know, we, we appreciate your work. Definitely we'll be following you. Definitely come back after you get the PhD, after you write that book, books. Uh, as a matter of fact, she's already sent the invitation to Naya. She might pull you in. You might be co-author of an article or a book. I really meant that, sis. So don't don't run when I'm like, Anaya, where are your 30 pages at? <laughs> I need it in two weeks. Don't run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely so proud of you. The, the department is proud of you. You know, when we, uh, I think I mentioned last week that uh, the Department of History at NCCU has uh, produced a lot of folk who are making huge contributions to uh, the profession. I'm going, I'm talking going back 50 and 60 years ago. And right now we have almost 100 people who, have the doctorates and another 12 to 15 or so working on PhDs or doctorates. And so we, are, uh, we, we pat ourselves on the back. We're very proud of the contribution that uh, we continue to make to the profession. And for, for you master's students, 10 of you who are here tonight in this class, um, if I'm teaching in the next two or three or four or five years, uh, hopefully you will come back and and do likewise, make a presentation. For, for next week, uh, uh, we're going to entertain the question, first of all, you know, what have you heard about Booker T. Washington, W.B. Du Bois, before you actually read anything about them? Uh, so think about that question. And then uh, what, uh, uh, the, the two articles that we're going to look at are R.J. Norrell's uh, Booker T. Washington, Understanding uh, the Wizard of Tuskegee. That, that one article, you know, is a three or four hour discussion. That, that is a huge, significant uh, piece of work in, in about uh, 15 pages. And, and the other one is The Civilizing Mission of Booker T. Washington. And of course, that's the one that you'll be writing an article review. So we'll spend our time looking at those two articles next week, class. All right. Anything from class? Any questions uh, from the 10 folks? I just wanted to say thank you so much, Ajne, for just like presenting this. And like, I think the subject kind of hit home for me personally, but also because what I'm studying is something that I also practice. And so, like, it means a lot to me that you've taken the time to do the extensive research and something that I don't feel like enough people are doing research about um, and, and putting it in communities where it matters for people to actually access it and know the information so that they can make better choices for themselves and for their family. So I just want to say thank you for your research. I appreciate that. Thank you. That's that's real confirmation right there. So I'm grateful. Thank you, Kayla. Other comments or questions?